Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Science at the Theater's Hope or Hype. What's next for biofuels? Sponsored by Friends of Berkeley Lab and co-sponsored by BERC, the Berkeley Energy Resources Collaborative. My name is Jeff Miller and I'm Head of Public Affairs. Tonight's Berkeley Lab panelists are Susanna Tringe and Jim Bristow of the Joint Genome Institute, uh, Jake Heasling from the Joint Bioenergy Institute, our moderator is John Fowler, Health and Science Editor of KTVU Channel 2. The conversation with our scientists will last about one hour. We'll be divided into four parts. Jake Heasling will start and close. You, however, will get the last word. We've reserved about 30 to 40 minutes for questions. Uh, there are microphones located on this level and also in the mezzanine section as well. Uh, we ask that you keep your questions short and your commentary shorter. Uh, we anticipate that there will be lots of questions. We want to have everyone uh, get their chance at the microphone. Uh, a last bit of housekeeping. Uh, you should have, ha should have received surveys when you entered. We ask that you fill them out and hand them back to our volunteers when you exit. Uh, they're an important way for us keeping track whether or not these are successful events or not. Uh, a reminder, too, that we'll be back on this stage on October 26th with another Science at the Theater uh, dark Secrets, uh, what science tells us about the hidden universe. We hope that you can come to that. Now, the last question for the evening for you is, we always ask how many of you are first-timers for science at the theater, if you could please raise your hands. Thank you all for coming. I can now justify my advertising budget. Uh, John, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I, I want to tell everyone here first uh, what we are and what we're not. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is have a conversation, and I think this is going to be very revealing. Uh, I had the opportunity, the privilege, in fact, uh, for the last half hour or so to talk to these three exciting scientists about their exciting work, and it truly is that. Um, they represent some of the best and the brightest in the Bay Area, perhaps the world, in this emerging science. And we are all in trouble. We're running out of petroleum. We're running out of the fossil fuel that's kept us going for a century or more. And there has to be something to replace it. And I think that uh, what you'll learn here in the next hour or so is a, a fascinating glimpse into the world of synthetic biology, really, is what it's about. This is a word that hadn't existed until a decade ago. And these three scientists here represent the brightest and the best minds in the world on this subject, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. So I want to start with uh, Jay Kiesling. Jay, what's the problem, and is biofuels the answer? Great, thanks. Well, uh, you pretty much summed up the issues. The Earth is warming. Uh, we've got increasing concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, there's a strong correlation between the warming of the Earth and the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, and those, that CO2 is derived from fossil fuels that we're burning. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, diminishing reserves of those fossil fuels, and that means that uh, in the near future, the cost of those fuels will go up substantially as their availability dwindles. And at the same time, we're sending a lot of our currency to uh, troubled parts of the world, um, unstable parts of the world. So there's a possibility of changing all of that. This is how we derive our petroleum-based fuels right now. Uh, petroleum, uh, old carbon, if you will, is pumped up from the ground. Uh, it is refined in refineries, and then we put that into our tanks. And when we burn that fossil fuel in our tanks, uh, in our engines that releases carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. That's carbon dioxide, carbon that would have been sequestered uh, for millennia underground is now being released into the atmosphere. Now, one possible route around this is the route we're currently using for producing corn-based ethanol. Carbon dioxide is captured by plants as they use sunlight to produce the plant itself. So they're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They're turning this into the plant itself. And in the case of corn, a great deal of that carbon is being sequestered as starch in the kernels. We then cut that corn, refine the starch, um, separating the starch from the rest of the kernel, uh, 
turn it into sugar using enzymes, and then that sugar is fermented to make ethanol. That ethanol is then burned, and that re returns carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So in a sense, this process could be carbon neutral, where the carbon captured by the plant is then burned in our tanks and released back into the atmosphere. Now, there are a few challenges with this route of corn to ethanol. I want to describe some of those challenges. And then we'll talk about some of the challenges in a replacement for corn and for ethanol. So uh, the first challenge is with corn. Uh, I happen to be from a farm in Nebraska where we grew a great deal of corn. Uh, and uh, I actually spoke about this last week at the University of Nebraska where this was considered near heresy. Uh, but uh, there are some challenges with corn. It takes a great deal of water. It takes a great deal of energy. So we fertilize corn to get the high yields that we're now getting on farms across the U.S. That fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer, ammonia fertilizer, is made using a great deal of energy. In fact, a third of the energy in agriculture today is used producing nitrogen-based fertilizers. One percent of the world's energy is used producing nitrogen-based fertilizers. Corn has been bet, bred as a food crop over centuries and engineered for the last couple of decades to be the best food crop we can possibly make. It's not ideal as an energy crop. What we'd like to replace that with, though, is biomass. Biomass from many different sources. If you imagine uh, all the paper in landfills, this is largely cellulose, largely polymers of sugar that could be converted into biofuels. Biomass in the form of uh, plant material. For instance, uh, in forests, trees that have fallen down that could be cleared. Uh, the uh, corn uh, stover, so all of the corn except for the kernel itself. All of that is biomass that could be turned into fuel. Now, the U.S. Department of Energy in, 19, in 2005 did a study and they estimated that there's about a billion tons of that biomass that's relatively unutilized that we could capture in some way. We could collect the corn stover from the fields. We could collect fallen down trees. Um, we could take the paper out of our landfills and convert that into fuels. Now, to give you some perspective of how much fuel we could make from that, this shows the amount of energy that we used in 2007 in terms of oil. In 2007, we used roughly 7.5 billion barrels of oil in the United States. Roughly two-thirds of that was imported oil, and a third of that was domestically produced. Now, if we take that billion tons of biomass and burn it, you could get nearly the energy equivalent to the energy in the imported oil. Let me say that again. That billion tons of biomass that's unutilized could be turned, if burned, into equivalent energy of that in the imported oil. And if we now turn that into biofuels, we could get roughly the amount of energy that we get out of our uh, domestically produced oil. But that's technology that we don't yet have available to us. Now, I just want to talk briefly about the end of this pipeline, and that is the fuel that we've chosen to produce. We've chosen to produce ethanol, and while ethanol is an interesting start and is a great oxygenate for our gasoline at small percentages, there are a number of challenges with it. The first challenge is that ethanol is produced by yeast. This is uh, yeast. It grows in large tanks like this. Ethanol is toxic to yeast. Ethanol can actually be used to uh, as, as a sterilizing agent. So when it gets up to about 15 to 20 percent in this large vat, it's toxic to the yeast and the yeast quit producing it. That means you've got 85 percent water in there that you have to get out before you can put that ethanol in your tank. And that requires energy intensive distillation. You're essentially boiling all of that water and ethanol to boil off the ethanol and purify it to get 95 to 100 percent ethanol that you would put into your tank. Now, the additional challenge is how do we get that ethanol to wherever we need to use it? That ethanol is produced largely in the Midwest where we have corn, and we need it to get it to the east and west coasts where most of the automobiles are. We can't pipe it because ethanol 
is corrosive to pipelines, so we have to ship it either by rail or by truck. And we're, right now, we're limited in rail cars and trucks to ship that ethanol. What's more, we can't use ethanol in airplanes or in diesel engines because it isn't compatible with those kinds of engines. I like to say that ethanol is for drinking, not for driving. <laughs> so if you were going to produce a replacement to ethanol, what would you produce? Well, I'd produce an oil or a biodiesel or a biojet fuel directly. Imagine if you could engineer a microbe to produce an oil and it would secrete that oil. We all know about oil and water. They don't mix. That oil could float to the top, and if it were the appropriate uh, uh, type of oil, it could be put directly into your gas tank, for instance, if it were uh, like the molecular weight of gasoline, or if it were slightly denser, it could be used as a diesel fuel or a jet fuel. And those are some of the challenges that we need to get beyond in producing uh, biofuels. Now, I just want to close my part here uh, by showing you the full cycle. So the idea is now to replace corn with uh, cellulosic-based biomass. Uh, this is a, a hay bale. That's a, a one possibility of getting that biomass. And to replace the ethanol with a transportation fuel that's compatible with our existing infrastructure. And there are a number of challenges along those routes. We have to degrade that biomass, and we have to engineer microbes to produce that fuel. And those are going to be the subjects of the next few talks that you're going to hear. Thanks. Jay, I have one, one more question. You said earlier that uh, ethanol doesn't work. Butanol, which we had discussed earlier, uh, might be something that could work because it has more carbons. More carbons, more better. Uh, it, that's the idea? That's right. So, so if you had a flex fuel car, uh, and you could put 85% ethanol in it, say uh, E85, you'd get about two-thirds of the miles that you would on a gallon of gasoline. So it has less energy density. The more carbons you put on that molecule, the more energy density you get. You also get an insolubility in the fermentation broth. So that means that as the chain gets longer, more carbons, it becomes less toxic because it's less soluble, and therefore it could just float to the top and you skim it off. Hmm. Butanol would be difficult. Hexanol is better, right? So as that chain becomes longer, it becomes a better fuel and less toxic to the producer. Great. Uh, my, my question, Jim, to you, how do you turn this biomass then into a fuel? How do you make that transition? Jay's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there are some major hurdles that um, understanding how these processes occur in nature uh, will help us to help us to, uh, to solve these problems. So yeah. I think if we, uh, if we want to change uh, our starting material from corn to other cellulosic materials, woody materials, we need to be able to grow those things in a way that we don't compete with, uh, with foodstuffs, with the, the land that's grown, uh, used for foodstuffs. We need to use uh, crops that provide the maximum yield on the, the minimal amount of land that we can possibly use to grow this biomass. We need to understand the process in nature that turn the, the, uh, the biomass, the sh sugars that are stored by plants in their cell walls into something that we can uh, then ferment into fuels or otherwise uh, uh, root through the metabolism of engineered microbes into even better fuels than, than uh, ethanol or lower alcohols. This is sort of solar energy, isn't it? Plants are like batteries. That's where our energy comes from. We have very few other sources. Ultimately, it all comes from the sun. Even the fossil fuels that we're burning ultimately came from plant materials that were produced uh, eons ago and, uh, and been, have been buried in the earth for a long time. But ultimately, the energy that produced them came from the sun. We need to re-harness that to try and, try and take recent carbon dioxide been fixed into, uh, into sugars in the plant cell walls and turned those into fuels. What's the ideal plant? Some people have talked about switchgrass and, and other grasses that grow naturally. Would, would that be a, a good source? I think it depends on, on where one lives. 
I think ultimately the strategies that are thinking of, that people are talking about involve different plants in different different parts of the country. So that in the Pacific Northwest, where poplar is grown renewably, uh, that might be your source of biomass. Now it may raise the cost of paper a little bit, but personally I'd rather have the cost of paper go up a little bit than the cost of food go up a little bit. Uh, in, uh, in the prairie states, marginal land that can't be used for corn and soybean could be used for, for switchgrass, giant grasses like, uh, like miscanthus. Uh, that produce a very high yield of biomass uh, uh, per acre will be used. In the south uh, and parts of the west, it'll be pine. Uh, in, in the southwest, the source of biomass might even be algae grown, uh, uh, grown in, the, uh, uh, in the New Mexico desert, for example. So depending on where you live, the biomass may, may come in a different flavor. Hmm. Uh, the way to turn the biomass then into a fuel would be through some genetic engineering of a microbe or what? Susanna, is that what, what we're after? Yeah, so the idea is that we could then find, find the enzymes that carry out these processes in organisms in nature and then harness those for our process to break down the biomass into something like sugars, which we can then find the pathways that could synthesize something that's a usable fuel out of those sugars. Nature already does this. Yeah. How? <laughs> Well, there are, there are lots of organisms that break down biomass. I mean, we, we're saying, you know, biomass is this great source of energy, but the reason we don't use it so far is because it's hard to break down, and yet clearly that happens all the time, and plants are always getting recycled into carbon dioxide, or else we wouldn't have a, the carbon cycle would be imbalanced, and we'd be depleting carbon dioxide from our atmosphere rather than adding it through these fossil fuels. And so we want to find out, you know, where are those organisms that degrade biomass, and what are the pathways that they're doing it with. So how are you finding these? Um, well, we're just looking in nature and saying who's breaking it down, you know, so there's animals that actually consume biomass, um, ranging from insects to ruminants to even, you know, marine organisms and birds that are able to convert the plant biomass into energy, and so we're trying to find out, you know, what pathways they, they use to do that. So we're going to reinvent the termite and the cow rumen, and, and that, is that... Well, we're going, to, we're going to pluck the pieces from those that we find useful and take them and put them into these synthetic biology pathways and try to make them do what we want them to do. Um, so we're in the parts yeah. business. Suzanne and I are at the, the Joint Genome Institute are really uh, not that different from, uh, uh, from your local car supply, supply uh, parts dealer. We just are dealing in genomic parts. And we're interested in, in understanding genomes, Genomes are the parts list for organisms. We're, in the, we're all about identifying those parts and allowing them to be made available to the broader biological community that's going to turn them into solutions to our problems. I'll tell you something. I talked to Susanna and Jim a little earlier and, and asked this question. And the answer I got is one I'm going to ask to elicit here. It's like taking a, a puzzle and finding the pieces, not a single puzzle, but hundreds or maybe even thousands of puzzles, dumping them all into a vat and picking out the pieces and seeing what works. Could you talk about how this sounds like a daunting challenge? Shall we, shall we, can I show you how we start? Sure. <laughs> so the genome, as I said, is just a parts list uh, for all of the cells parts. In, in a human, each of your cells has uh, uh, two copies of every chromosome, and together they uh, encode the proteins that allow us to do what we do. The genetic material that constitutes the genome for most of the organisms we're interested in, sorry, uh, is DNA. There are other nucleic acids that are, are uh, RNA particularly in, in some viruses, but for all intents and purposes, DNA is the molecule that, that we're going to be interested in talking about tonight. And it has this, um, this by now w quite familiar double helical structure. And when that structure was solved by Crick and Watson in 1953, one of the things that popped out at them immediately was this base pairing in which T was always matched with A in the structure and G was always matched with C in the structure. And that suggested to them the obvious mechanism whereby DNA could replicate itself because if you separated these two strands, you knew what had to go in the linear order of these 
G's, A's, T's, and C's on the, on the DNA, in the DNA structure. So G always pairs with C, T always pairs with A, and our job as DNA sequencers is to read those linear orders of G's, A's, T's, and C's. So uh, when we do that, I've stripped away one of the copies of the DNA strand here to give just some, uh, a random piece of a gene. And what the cell does is generate an RNA copy and then a, an RNA copy of the DNA that can be read here, uridine replaces thymidine, but otherwise it simply uh, behaves, uh, uh, follows that same rule, G with C, this time uh, U with A, and T. Uh, you can then translate this code, source of another Nobel Prize, three at a time, into the specific amino acids, which are the building blocks, the structural building blocks. They, tr they turn out the enzymes that allow us to carry out metabolic processes. All of this is derived from the linear sequence of the DNA. So if we can get that linear sequence of the DNA, we have a chance of understanding the parts list for every organism. And there's been really a, an enormous increase in the capabilities in this realm over the last several years. What I've shown here is the, the sequencing output at the JGI since uh, I joined the JGI in, two, in 2004. And at that time, we used uh, a method developed by Fred Sanger, yet another Nobel Prize. Uh, and the crux of this reaction, or of this uh, system, was that we carried out DNA sequencing reactions 96 at a time. And we were able to scale that up by hiring lots of people and, and buying lots of these uh, capillary sequencing machines, which you see here. Uh, but we were still quite limited in the amount of output. And we managed to get up to about 30 billion bases of sequence. And that's 10 human genomes a year. Pretty good effort for a, a modest-sized facility like ours. But as you can see, in the last couple of years, our sequencing output has really begun to increase uh, exponentially. And the reason for that is the introduction of two new machines, one from 454 technology, shown here, that allows us to do 500,000 sequencing reactions at a time. And yet another machine from, uh, from Illumina, originally developed by a company called Selexa, but then purchased by Illumina, that allows us to run 100 million sequencing reactions at a time. And the net result of that is a sequencing output that's increased to almost 800 billion bases of DNA sequence in a year. So that's, uh, that's what, about 250 individuals uh, in a year, about the capacity of the number of people that are, that are here now. Well, that's allowed us to really scale up what, um, uh, what we can do as a sequencing facility. So how does this all fit together? Well, um, we start, uh, by getting the material that we're interested in sequencing. We have a program where we ask investigators who are interested in DOE relevant problems that might benefit from having a genome sequence to bring us those problems. We have an annual proposal process and we get some really interesting biology and some fascinating uh, uh, science brought to us through that program. Uh, the hardest part of any genome project is right here. That's getting the DNA in the door. High quality DNA to sequence is really the hardest part of any sequencing project. But once we've done that, after investigators have spent months figuring out how to get nice, large chunks of DNA, the first thing we do is take that DNA and share it into tiny little fragments. A little disappointing for some of them. And then we sequence those thousands, millions of fragments. So we get this linear G's, A's, T's, and C's. And then uh, people with enormous computer skills, like Susanna, take all these random pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and start to assemble them based on their alignments with one another. And if we're dealing with a relatively simple microbial genome, as I've shown here, it should end up in a whole circle. Frequently, there's some holes. And we have to do some sort of manual improvement of the genome to be able to get this thing into a complete genome sequence. But we're now in a, in a position to be able to do this for microbes a couple of hundred times a year. And for more complicated organisms, it takes us a little longer. Of course, those are just letters. One of my early ex earliest experiences at the JGI was delivering a DNA sequence to a, a uh, 
young uh, graduate student, I don't remember where exactly, and she called me up shortly after we'd sent her the sequence and she said, I opened the file but it's just letters. <laughs> um, and she was right. I told her she looked carefully and she'd see actually there were only four <laughs> letters. <laughs> uh, but we helped her out by, uh, by going the next step and that's finding the genes and proteins within that sequence. And we now have computational methods for simple organisms that allows us to do that with very high accuracy. For higher organisms, we need a little more help in trying to find the genes, and we need some experimental data to tell us exactly what genes look like in different kinds of organisms. But we can generate those data on our, on our sequencing machines as well. So after we've, uh, after we've um, found the genes, uh, we assign them names and functions, and frequently, to the best of our ability, for many organisms, at least half the genes will have no idea about what they do, and we may have never seen them before, because many of the organisms we're sequencing are from very diverse parts of the, uh, uh, the uh, tree of life. But one of the very important things about sequencing lots of genomes is that you, you learn a lot from sequencing one genome, you learn way more if you sequence some related genomes and can, and can compare them. I picked here uh, just a random uh, genome and a random gene shown here in red uh, about which there was absolutely nothing known. And using a system developed at JGI, I aligned it to several other genomes the, that had the most similar copies to this gene. And one of the things that you'll see is, while there's really not a lot shared between most of these genomes, you can see that there's a, a set of four or five genes that are very much uh, reproduced in their order and size in this genome, and most of them are also present in this genome. And in bacterial genomes, at least, that clustering of, of, uh, of genes of related sequence usually suggests that there's related functions for those, the genes that are closely clustered like that. And using this sort of comparative, uh, this sort of comparative analysis, we can oftentimes find mistakes that we've made in our sequencing or in our gene calling, and more importantly, we can get at some of the, uh, some of the potential functions of these genes. You're really kind of, at this point, you're peering into nature's blueprint for not just these organisms, but what they all do. Right. And one of the really fun things about this is that uh, many of these will have never been seen before. Nobody has ever thought about these genes before. And we, we now have a system where we are sharing these kinds of data for organisms that uh, we've generated simply to, to begin to understand the diversity of microbes. We're making those available to students. And students are starting to play around with some of these data and looking at things that nobody has ever seen before, where there's no right answer, unlike any kind of laboratory that they've ever seen before. It's really quite an exciting uh, Quite an exciting advance for us. Sure, the graduate students do all the work and you guys get all... <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so how are we going to use these things? Uh, we need to make better biomass. We need to understand how to get more biomass on an acre of land. So we've been interested in, in sequencing the biomass substrates or, or reasonable um, comparators for biomass substrates for the last several years. So we've sequenced the poplar genome, uh, was the first tree to be sequenced. We've sequenced uh, sorghum, which is the second uh, bioenergy crop in the U.S. currently. We participated in the maize genome sequence. We're just starting with switchgrass and with, and with miscanthus, miscanthus um, which are complicated genomes, talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And because they're so complicated, we've worked on some other grasses that are, have somewhat simpler genomes. And uh, we suspect that we may be able to learn something about the more complicated genomes by sequencing these, these simpler models. First. They're somewhat related. Right. We also um, are interested in degrading biomass. Susanna's going to talk about this a lot more, but this is really from my perspective, the crux of the, of the problem in converting cellulose into fuels. Plants have spent the last several hundred million years learning how not to be degraded uh, because they can't run away from their enemies. Uh, so they have a cell wall that's really quite impenetrable. But we're also not wading through uh, 
trees and uh, through tree branches and leaves on our way to work in the morning. So somehow the biomass that exists and the trees that have died are getting broken down in nature. And uh, one of our tasks is to understand the parts list from the organisms that are doing that in nature. And then finally, fuel synthesis. Um, you know, we're, we're fermenting uh, sugars into ethanol now the way the Egyptians did, you know, 6,000 years ago. We ought to be able to do better than that. We should be able to find organisms that are more tolerant to, uh, to the, uh, the substrates that they're producing. Uh, we're sequencing uh, engineered E. coli that are more uh, resistant to alcohol or that, or that produce other uh, potential fuel substrates. We're interested in biogas as well. Uh, we're interested in communities that make, uh, uh, that make mixed alcohols. There are lots of different people with different strategies about how to do this. They are bringing those problems to us and allowing us to produce the genomes of the organisms that they're interested in to help them Modify their, modify their processes. So, so you get a handful of stuff, soil or, or rotting leaves or something, and then, then what do you, literally, what do you do with it? Well, we don't get that. We ask them to make DNA okay. from it first. <laughs> right. uh, and the reason we do that is because frequently making, as I said, making the DNA is the hardest part of a genome project in many instances. The investigators who have been working on these systems for decades usually have a pretty good idea about how to go about that, a much better idea than we would. Uh, so we have some tips. We can put them in contact with other people who have faced similar problems if they, when they run into trouble. Uh, but by and large, they're better suited to make the DNA and ship us the DNA than to have us try and tackle that part of the, that part of the process. Sure. Uh, well, Susanna, could I ask you, what, brown rot fungi and white rot fungi, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what we're modeling? Yeah, I mean, those are very effective biomass degraders. You know, if trees are decomposing in the forest, you're going to find tons of fungi, and those are some of the only organisms that can really break down all the different components of that biomass. And so those genomes have yielded a wealth of information of how this actually ha happens in nature that we really didn't have before sequencing those genomes. And they've yielded these enzymes that we can then use, whether as part of, you know, in that organism or engineered into some other organism that will actually help us break down that plant material. Oh, I can see it now. Brown rot fuel here. That's, that's <laughs> uh, so what do these things do and how do they do it? And what is it you're trying to mimic? The reason... Like, as we were saying, that we're not using biomass to make fuels now. It's just that it can be so hard to degrade. And that's because starch, which is what we're currently using, is really straightforward to break down into sugars. It's just a bunch of sugar molecules linked together with one kind of bond. And so you only need one kind of enzyme to break mm. that down. And then cellulose is also a polymer of sugars. It's a slightly different one that tends to form these very insoluble crystals. So the enzymes can do it, but they have a hard time getting at the material. So that's one obstacle. But then cellulose is only a fraction of the biomass. There's also these other components, hemicellulose and lignin. Hemicellulose is made up of sugars, but it has these much more complex branch structure that you need many enzymes to degrade. And lignin is completely disordered and has a different structure in every different kind of plant that is not very amenable to, to enzymatic breakdown. And those fungi are some of the only things that can do it. And they do it often by non-enzymatic processes. They do free radical chemistry that just sort of shreds it apart because that's one of the only ways to get rid of that, which is this glue that keeps you from getting at the cellulose that really contains the sugars. That's why redwood trees last so long, I would take yeah. it in. Yeah, and so trees make a ton of lignin, and that's really what makes them rigid. And so when we're engineering these biomass feedstocks, one thing that we think about is maybe you could get rid of some of that lignin because you don't need your biomass fuel feedstocks to stand up straight for any length of time. And then you can grow more of your carbon into something you can make into an actual fuel. And so, like we said, though, nature is very good at getting these things degraded. And so, in nature, we've tried to look at, you know, where, what are the organisms that are actually carrying out this process. And so, um, we know that wood is pretty stable until something actually manages to infiltrate it. Something like a termite can actually digest a huge quantity of wood, which is an otherwise very stable substance. And so they're actually responsible for much of the biomass breakdown, especially in tropical regions. Um, there are other wood eaters, like uh, the shipworm is actually a marine organism that can eat boats and docks. And you can find wood from 
the ocean that's riddled with these holes that from these bivalves that actually burrow into them. And they break, break the biomass down by a completely different method than termites. And, yet, and then there's animals that eat grass, like ruminants, cows, and kangaroos actually eat grass as well. And we've, we've got projects to study all of these organisms, including other insects that can break down biomass. At least I think I mentioned there's a, there's a bird that eats leaves and is actually able to ferment in a rumen-like compartment, despite being a small bird that needs to be able to take off and fly with all that mass in it. And that bird's name um, is the? The stink bird. <laughs> <laughs> Stink bird. <laughs> because it makes because so it much produces methane when it breaks down these, uh, <laughs> these leaves. I really wanted to share that with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of methane. Lots of methane. And, um, and you also know that just if you have a backyard compost heap, that just by treating biomass a certain way, you can actually accelerate the degradation quite a bit over something just you know, sitting on the ground. And then these fungi that we mentioned can really break down uh, break down trees and other biomass pretty effectively. And so this is really distributed across the whole phylogenetic tree. Because biomass is such an abundant en energy source, the ability to utilize it has evolved many different times. But the interesting thing that we found is that it hasn't really evolved independently because all of these processes depend on microorganisms. The single cell organisms are the ones that really produce the enzymes that break down that biomass. That cows couldn't eat grass if they didn't have organisms in their rumen that actually broke it down for them, they would starve. And the same with termites or kangaroos or any of these. In general, the, all the enzymes that degrade that biomass is from microorganisms. And so the genome projects that we have studying all of these are studying microbial uh, communities in these different habitats. And those communities are made up of a lot of different organisms. And we want to find out something about all of those because they work as a team to break down the biomass. It doesn't seem like there's any one organism in there that's actually capable of doing it. It's really a whole community. And so that brings in metagenomics. And so the traditional way you might study these, these communities is you take the sample that you know is carrying out the, the activity that you want, and you take it back to your lab and you try to grow it. Maybe you try to grow it on cellulose or some kind of biomass to get really something that's degrading it. And so you bring it back, you get it on your, on your culture, and then you can take those organisms, grow them up, and sequence their genomes, and that would be genomics. And we've done quite a bit of this with biomass degrading individual microorganisms. But we still find that in these various biomass degrading environments, most of those organisms aren't the ones that actually grow on your plates when you take it back into the lab. You might be able to find one that actually degrades biomass, but most of those ones just don't seem to grow well in the lab. And so it's been really difficult to study them. You know they're there. You can find them. You can find their genetic signatures, but you can't find out much about them because you can't actually culture, culture them, and you can't do their, sequence their genomes because you don't have them in culture. And so ultimately with the... Uh, and so it's just that pie chart is showing that the estimates are that something like 1% of organisms will actually grow in the lab. The other 99% are just sort of unknown and ungrowable. But an alternate way of getting at those organisms is to just say, we know they have DNA, and we can sequence that DNA straight off, and then try to get it back into those genomes, or even just study it as it is without really associating it directly back to a genome, and look for the genes that are what we're interested in within that whole mess of, da of data. But as you were saying, that's kind of like taking a lot of different puzzles, all these different genomes, and chopping them up and putting them in one big bin and then trying to reassemble it afterwards. So it makes it a much more complex um, problem. And so, and the reason it's called metagenomics is that there's the, the concept is that this these set of organisms don't just happen to be together. They're really a community. And so their genome or combined genome is called a meta genome by analogy of a meta-analysis, which is a combination of many different analyses in one. And so we're really trying to study that community genome as though it's an organism, rather than breaking it up into all of those different organisms. So you try to tease out a, a signal then out of these, this pile of DNA? What is the stuff that you're interested in? Is there a yeah. common thread? Yeah, and so there's a lot of different angles you can take to get at those nuggets of useful information. And one is that we do know a lot about the enzymes that break down biomass from isolate genome projects. And so we can look for enzymes similar to those 
but that might have a different set of domains next to each other because often you'll have you know, an enzymatic component to a protein and something that binds the biomass and another part of the protein. You might have different combinations in there or they'll have a little different activity because even just changing a little bit of the sequence can often change the, the exact substrate that something targets. And so we can pull out all of those things by just comparing them in a computer and saying these are all of my potential enzymes and then we feed those to the synthetic biologists or the enzymologists and they can test those and determine if any of these ha have activities that are really what we're looking for. Um, another is that you, by these comparative kind of methods, you can just look for things that are more common in that environment than in other environments where the substrate that they're digesting isn't really biomass. You know, if you look, for, look at a community that's living on sugar or right. something else, then you can say what enzymes are really important for this particular uh, community. Um, it sounds really complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is the computer absolutely vital to this? You, could, you couldn't do this yeah. without it? Yeah, we couldn't even do the DNA sequencing without the computer because it would just, you wouldn't, the data is generated so fast that no one would ever be able to, to process it. Okay, so now you have the gene you want. Mm -hmm. Jay, what do, what do you do with the gene now? You, we have this genetic code that Jim explained to us, just four little letters, and you're going to try to make kerosene with that? That's right. That's so well, how? Let's, let's, let's talk about that process. So I talked about how we produce ethanol and the challenges with that. We'd really like to produce a transportation fuel that would work with our current infrastructure. So if we think about what you might want to produce, uh, you might want to produce an oil that you could just send to a refinery. So this oil would come out of the microbe. It would be produced using the sugar. The microbe would act as a catalyst to turn it into an oil. We just send that to a refinery and turn that into all the different products that we get from petroleum now, like gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, jet fuel. You also might want to just produce the fuel directly. So imagine that we could engineer a microbe that would produce diesel fuel, and that diesel fuel would just float to the top, and you skim it off and put it into your tank directly. No refinery involved. But it's got to have a high energy content, unlike ethanol. It should be storable and transportable because we need to use it in the same way that we use our transportation fuels now, that is, pipe them over a long distance and maybe store them at a location. It's got to be compatible with our infrastructure. And above all, it's got to be affordable so that we actually want to use it. Now let's talk a little bit about the process of producing that fuel. So uh, we typically use a microbe uh, to produce the fuel. It acts as a catalyst. Microbes have, just like every li living organism, take in sugars and through a series of chemical reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes, they turn that into various products. Some of those happen to be useful products like uh, ethanol, for instance, or like uh, biodiesel or biogasoline. Now, this is a very simplified view of what the metabolic reactions look like inside a cell. It actually looks more like that, where each one of these might represent an enzyme with a chemical reaction. So it's really complicated. There are literally thousands of reactions going inside, on inside the cell at any one time. And the question is, how do you go in and engineer one particular reaction or a series of reactions to get the specific product that you want? So we've already heard uh, from Jim and Susanna about uh, where we get our natural parts list. So uh, through sequencing, we get this native parts list, um, and those components are then components that we can use to engineer the microbe. So for instance, there are a lot of plants that produce oils. If we could get the genes that naturally produce those are responsible for producing the oils in those plants and transplant them to a microbe, then we might be able to get that microbe to produce that same oil. But it's not trivial. We start out with a parts list. We need to characterize those parts because, after all, they're coming from nature. We don't know anything about them. But we want to assemble them into a microbe, much like we might assemble the parts to build a computer. Now, that assembly actually is relatively time consuming. How you take a single component, characterize it, and then assemble it together to form a series of components that would uh, catalyze a reaction inside the cell is really complicated. And then we have to place 
that big piece of DNA into the microbes to produce our various fuels. Now, as I said, this is much like putting all the components together to build a computer. Unfortunately, in biology, we don't have things like standardized connections, nor do we have a biofab to go out and buy components, like we go out to a radio shack and buy components. So assembling all of these components is a much trickier job than, say, replacing the hard drive in your computer. Now, why do we think that this is going to work, work for biofuels? Well, one of the reasons we think it's going to work for biofuels is that we've done a proof of concept with a different hydrocarbon. This happens to be a hydrocarbon that is the leading cure for malaria. It's called artemisinin, and it comes from this plant, Artemisia annua. And over a series of years, my lab took the genes from Artemisia annua and from yeast and put them into a single microbe to produce this drug. And we've come up about 10 million fold in the titers, and this is currently at Sanofi Aventis, where they're commercializing the process, uh, scaling it up so that we can produce in the next year or two years an affordable anti-malarial drug. Well, as I said, this is a hydrocarbon. It's very similar to diesel fuel or jet fuel, and, and I, I want to reassure you, as I did on the Colbert report, that we're not injecting biofuels into babies. Uh, but we've got an engineered organism in our hand that produces a hydrocarbon. We can swap out a few genes, replace them with genes that are now would make a biodiesel or a biogasoline, and we've got an organism now that will produce these in relatively high yield. So how are we going to put all this together? How are we going to do all this? Well, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, in fact, in 2007, we recruited at Berkeley, both Berkeley Lab and the University of California, Berkeley, substantial support from both BP and from the U.S. Department of Energy to help us, uh, to give us the funding so that we could do the research into all of these challenges, into turning biomass into biofuels. And right now, we're working both in the Energy Biosciences Institute here on the UC Berkeley campus and at the Joint Bioenergy Institute in Emeryville on solving some of these um, really difficult challenges in turning biomass into biofuels. Uh, it sounds great. I'm a little worried about when that bug gets out into the environment and starts turning my forest into a sea of petroleum. Great question. Uh, so... Uh, We've been doing genetic engineering since the early 70s, and uh, the whole goal of synthetic biology is really to make the engineering of biology more predictable, more reproducible, uh, easier to do. And so when you make biology more predictable, that means that there's much less chance of an organism getting out and, and getting into the environment and turning all the biomass into biofuels. Um, we also intentionally build these organisms so that they can't survive out in the wild, so you can uh, put a few deletions in key genes so that those organisms require multiple nutrients in order to survive and grow in the fermentation tanks, that they would never find that combination out in the wild. So there are many things we can do to prevent that, and, and we're actively working on that as well. But there are, can be unintended consequences for any technology. Do you anticipate that there may be a hurdle here, some, even an environmental challenge because of that? Yes, there are always unintended consequences of technology. We've seen this with every technology, and, and we'll see this. You know, for instance, you could engineer uh, a plant that would be uh, a great biofuel crop, but might, uh, under some particular growing season or some condition, be susceptible to a fungus or to blight. And we've seen this with engineered corn, even corn that's been bred without genetic engineering. So there can be unintended consequences of even some old-fashioned technologies. Uh, I guarantee you that by planting, rather than, by altering the standard corn soybean, ro soybean rotation uh, that was done in the last uh, several years to try and improve uh, corn production for corn ethanol, we changed the, the nature of the microbial community in the ground. We undoubtedly did that mm -hmm. by altering the soybean fixes nitrogen, uh, organisms that require that nitrogen to live in the ground uh, probably, uh, probably didn't do so well during those years. So anytime we 
alter an environment, we are absolutely going to alter the, uh, the biodiversity around it. And our, our goal, I would think, would be to try and understand that and manage it as opposed to just closing our eyes and saying, no, we're not, we're not producing changes or we don't care about the changes. I think there's, a, there's plenty of work to do there. But we finally have the tools to be able to do that kind of work. Well, when some of the criticism about uh, the biofuel industry has been about biodiversity and about the problem, if it should be accepted, and biofuel crops become very popular and, and uh, cost-effective, uh, replacing ordinary uh, jungle habitat in Central America is what many people are worried about. For instance, turn Brazil into a... Uh, um, in, into a single or a mono uh, crop uh, place. <laughs> That's, that doesn't sound good. Well, I think we always have to worry about the biodiversity, and we, we of course, want to preserve uh, the rainforests. Uh, but uh, the truth is that uh, we've been doing that for years with uh, just planting uh, food crops as well. Uh, and other crops. So uh, we've been doing that regardless. Uh, we'd like to prevent that to the extent we can, and, and that's why it's extremely important that we have high-yielding, energy, dedicated energy crops. We want crops that don't require a lot of fertilizer so that we don't have to pollute the atmosphere further with carbon dioxide in producing that fertilizer. We'd like crops that can be extremely high yield so they take advantage of the land that's there. We'd also like crops that, say, could be drought tolerant because then you could take advantage of uh, marginal lands, lands that might not be suited for planting food crops or other types of crops uh, we might be able to use for planting potential biofuel crops. Well, the replacement of food obviously is a big issue. Uh, there's another issue. MIT, a couple of years ago, did a study where they looked at the um, amount of energy required to make biofuels. Uh, turned out to be more than one. I mean, it took more energy to create than it brought out of it. Is, is that a hurdle that we can't overcome? I think it's a definite hurdle. Uh, I think that petroleum is also a very energy intensive industry. Uh, the reality in the U.S. is that we are going to drive cars. We need a liquid transportation fuel for the foreseeable future. We need to be able to, uh, we need to, be able to fly jet aircraft. Uh, one of the biggest investors in the biofuels industry is the U.S. military because they are the world's largest consumer of transportation fuels. So I think for the foreseeable future, we're going to need transportation fuels. We need to be able to do it with as little energy input as we can, uh, both to drive down cost and in addition to minimize the, uh, the impact on, uh, on greenhouse gas uh, liberation. So the more neutral we can get these... Uh, we can get these technologies, the better. But it's going to take a little time to get there. I think if, I, I think if uh, we had all gotten here on, in uh, horse-drawn carriages today, and I had described for you a system where we're going to drill oil in, in, uh, in Alaska, and we're going to drive it down here in large boats, we're going to offload it to a, a large uh, uh, refining station, uh, just north of here, and we'll uh, then refine it. Uh, we'll then take that refined fuel and the various products. We'll ship them all over the western United States, and we'll be able to sell it to you for three bucks a gallon. You'd say I was nuts. But we spent a century doing it, and the technology is extraordinarily mature. It's been refined and refined and refined and refined through a century of American know-how. We need to apply that same American know-how to a new kind of transportation fuel. We need to leverage what we, what we can from the existing infrastructure. And I think the, the energy companies have grasped this. What's, what's different now than 1973 is that the energy companies recognize that this is an emerging market for them. The energy companies are starting to participate. BP, Chevron, Shell, even Exxon, is now, uh, is now investing in, in algal biofuels. So uh, I think the, it is a rare time, George Schultz makes the point, it's a rare time that the environmental interests, national security interests, forward-looking energy, energy companies, and uh, uh, the Department of Energy are all on the same page 
and everybody is looking at biofuels as essential for energy security. Uh, three months ago, uh, Shell in Canada opened a, uh, it's for a month only, uh, the first ever public biofuel gas station in Ottawa. Uh, they only ran it for a month, but they did nevertheless have a public, the world's first, public gas station using biofuels. They used cellulosic fuels, the same process that you're talking about. Uh, why is that not working? They closed it. I think it's just the economy of it right now that we just don't have the technology to make it cheaply but I think that we have we know where we need to go and we need to optimize it I mean the same way that synthesizing artemisinin would have cost a fortune with the path, pathways and tools that they had a decade ago you know and the cost of that can be brought down to something that is competing with the natural product I think the same way that if we can get it down to a cost that's effective we can do it I mean they've shown that it is technologically possible, it's just not inexpensive. And so that's an easier hurdle than something that couldn't be done. And we've, and we've spent relatively small amounts of money trying to solve this problem. I mean, if you consider the energy business is the biggest business in the world right now as a sector, um, and they spend less on research uh, in the petroleum industry than the concrete industry. Uh, and we all know how much research probably goes into concrete, right? <laughs> so uh, we, we spent relatively little money. And in fact, uh, there was a big effort on this uh, in cellulosic fuels in the late 70s. And then in January of 1981, that all came to a halt, screeching halt. And we've essentially been without significant funding in this area until two years ago. Right. So, in that time period, Brazil has been working on uh, advanced sugarcane. They've been working <coughs> on advanced uh, microbes to turn that sugarcane into ethanol. And they've changed most of their infrastructure now to be able to handle ethanol. Um, we've got a significantly larger infrastructure than they do, and we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, but imagine if we had been uh, spending money on research in this area since 1981, where we'd be today. We've got to accelerate that. We can't wait 20 years to catch up. Uh, we've got to get that done now. And so that's why it's really important that the Department of Energy and fuel companies, uh, petroleum companies, come together and, and sponsor this research. And they are. And they are. Um, I'd like to turn this over to the public. I, I bet there are many questions out here. I have a bunch more if you don't have any. Uh, if you do have questions, can you step up and go to one of the two microphones that are at the two uh, corners of the tops of these stairs? And uh, if you'd be kind enough to, to uh, say the question and address it to one of the panel, it would be great. Thanks. You, sir. Jay, can you comment on, on the timeline and the order of magnitude of the investments that are needed and by when they are needed in order to actually replace the entire infrastructure that you intend to replace. Right. We're talking about, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 refineries at a billion a pop and uh, we need to do that pretty quickly. Right. So uh, let's talk about the order of magnitude of money. So we're talking about our transportation infrastructure. So we're talking <coughs> about two, three trillion dollars, right? We're not going to replace all of that. And that, in fact, is the big motivation for producing fuels that will work within our existing transportation infrastructure, fuels that behave exactly like the petroleum-based fuels. Uh, so let's talk about the timeline. Uh, there are different aspects of this timeline that will be accomplished uh, earlier. So if you look at, um, say, engineering microbes to produce fuels, those microbes uh, actually can grow relatively quickly. We, uh, through synthetic biology, are getting better and better at engineering those microbes. Those are timelines that uh, I think we can accomplish in kind of the five-year five time frame. And in fact, there are a number of advanced biofuels companies that hope to have products out in the 2011-2012 time frame. So those are the kind of short-term time frames. Breaking down biomass, finding uh, enzymes in the environment, organisms in the environment that are very efficient at that, engineering new enzymes that will break down biomass even faster, uh, 
Um, those, are, those can be, you know, on the five-year time frame as well to 10-year time frame. But note, companies have been working in this area for some time, Novozymes and, and Genencore. So uh, there's still a significant amount of work to be done there. But uh, those timelines are, you know, in the five to 10-year range. If you look at the longest timelines, those are the plant timelines. So to get a plant, a new, an engineered plant into the field is, is similar in timeline to getting a drug um, into the clinic. It takes a lot of testing, a lot of field testing, and you know that those have to come up over seasons. And, and so there are many tests, and, and rightly so. We need those tests uh, to ensure that those organisms are fit for the environment. So those are much longer time frames, and, and the engineering of plants is significantly more challenging. So um, there are things we can accomplish uh, quickly and things that are going to take significant amount of time. Sir. Um, I was intrigued by your comment of mining our landfills, and rather, I have a slightly different maybe vision of the infrastructure. I'd like a vehicle that had this digester that you're trying to make, where I could put my junk mail and my old newspapers, <laughs> and overnight it turns out um, gasoline or diesel, okay, and the next day it makes me five gallons or something, and I drive it to work and back. Is that something that you see happening in the near future? It's a great dream, <laughs> and, and certainly one I'd like to have in my garage as well. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, and, and here's the challenge with, with biomass. If we could build one that would take your waste newspapers and chew them up and produce fuel, uh, maybe the next day you drop a cardboard box in it, and the whole system would completely crash. And, and uh, or you'd throw some orange peels in and it would completely crash. Uh, and that's going to be the challenge uh, with biofuels. You heard Jim talk about uh, we're going to have different crops depending on different parts of the country. And those are probably going to take different systems that will create those fuels because each one of those crops are, are slightly different. If you're taking switchgrass, that's much easier to grind up than, say, a pine tree. Um, and the composition of the biomass that you get out of, of switchgrass is different from a pine tree. So we are probably going to have um, facilities that are dedicated to certain types of biomass. Some of those might actually be uh, biomass in the form of waste paper, um, but they're going to be, I think, dedicated facilities. And doing it at a small scale sounds really great, but if you think about um, the fuel is going to come out and need some kind of purification. You're going to have to skim it off the top uh, or whatever, uh, and do a few steps of purification before you put it into your automobile. I think this is something that's probably better done at a professional facility. <laughs> but great idea. I love it. But we do have the, we do have the luxury of, of identifying uh, relevant communities that allow us to take these different waste streams, different bio, biomass substrates, uh, and tailor the, the bioprocess and the bioprospecting bio that precedes it to accommodate those various waste streams. And I think that's going to be critical to making this happen. So as Jay suggested earlier, this is going to be a buckshot approach, not a, not a, not a silver bullet. And Susanna, you're working on more than just one genome. You're yeah, and we're looking, yeah, and we're looking at organisms that break down things like wood, things like grasses, you know, all the, all the different kinds of biomass that we might be dealing with. And so we can learn something about how the nature approaches those differently and what specific enzymes might really be useful for breaking down wood, even if they're not useful for breaking down grass or vice versa. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We have one up here. Oh, oh yeah. I beg pardon. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I think you touched on it before, the cutting down or the uh, advancement on the Amazon rainforest has to be a, a serious concern for anybody. We ha we're having food shortages in Mexico, uh, even in Iceland. So taking away, uh, you know, grasslands or food crops to feed our automobiles I w I'm, what I want to ask of, of this particular group is how much is your um, money going into reducing the usage, in other words, from personal vehicles to mass transportation, and basically getting the public either onto bicycles 
or basically getting away from the personal cars because this behavior certainly can't keep going on with the Amazon rainforest shrinking and the Arctic Circle pretty much non-existent right now. So efficiency is going to be really an important part of this. Uh, people driving energy efficient cars, uh, people riding bicycles whenever they can. Any way we can cut down on energy use uh, means that we don't have to produce that energy. And fortunately, we are all associated with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And for the last few decades, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory has led the country in energy efficiency. Many of the energy efficiency standards are due to research at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Windows, lighting efficiency, uh, even appliance efficiency standards have all been pioneered at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So uh, the lab as a whole has, for the last few decades, been spending a great deal of money and resources on this because we really believe that efficiency is the first and best thing we can be doing. Could, it, could I uh, follow up with that? You, you came across with a product like a nuclear bomb and a nuclear energy, which we're now basically trying to get rid of the remnants, and it's driving down University Avenue with the Bevatron remnants, so I'm not really a fan of what you invented. Yes, sir. You've um, shown us how we've uh, turned uh, corn into ethanol and how we found that there are uh, consequences to that. That is, the price of corn goes up, uh, it affects our food supply. Now you want to uh, uh, turn um, biomass uh, into fuel. Has anybody researching, thinking about, well, you say that na nature uh, uh, naturally reduces this biomass into stuff. All right, is anybody thinking about what this stuff it, it reduces it into? How is nature using it? What will happen to nature if you take away the source of that stuff, that is the biomass, and use it for our own purposes? So it's, people are thinking about that. Um, it's a rel quantitatively speaking, it's a relatively small amount of biomass compared to the, the total primary pro productivity of, on land mass of, say, North America. The amount of biomass we need to remove uh, for energy needs is a relatively small fraction of that. Um, there will be consequences, but uh, the, the idea is to minimize those consequences by growing crops don't require a lot of additional water, that uh, don't require fertilizers, that will grow on marginal lands that aren't being used for, for food crops. One of the beauties of, of the, the uh, giant grasses, for example, is that they can be harvested late in the year after they pulled most of the nutrient, particularly the nitrogenous uh, uh, compounds, amino acids, their proteins have been broken down. They pull that down into underground for the winter and we can harvest what's above ground, which is the woody material, uh, uh, so they need a lot less nitrogen fertilizer as a result. So it's that kind of strategy that people are thinking about and ultimately you'd like to engineer those crops so that they're even more productive require even less in the way of fertilizer, water, etc. And maybe I can just follow up with that. One of the, the crops that we're working on uh, at the Joint Bioenergy Institute is rice. And uh, the importance of that is that uh, after the rice is picked, rice straw uh, in the past in California and many parts of the world is typically burned um, off the fields. Now imagine if you could collect that rice straw and turn that into fuels so that it isn't just burned and wasted, but in fact we're turning that into fuels that people could use. And this is, you know, rice is the biggest food crop, uh, or one of the biggest. This is something that could be used in all parts of the world and benefit people in the developing world as well. I have what you, you say in the developing world as well. How difficult and how technologically advanced would one of these um, refineries be? Is it uh, like a, you, you mentioned earlier, it might be like a... Uh, it's, it's like brewing beer. Okay. It's like brewing beer. In fact, uh, we're engineering yeast, taking out the pathways that naturally produce ethanol and replacing them with pathways that would produce hydrocarbons that you could put into your tank so that it would be as simple as brewing beer or wine. It's a fuel brewery. Yes. Same scale, I mean, same in a build, small building. 
Good. Well, we use a lot more fuel than beer or wine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a similar concept. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. All right. My first comment is to you, Mr. Fowler. I just want to say that I am really digging those boots. <laughs> cool. We're all <laughs> digging those boots, man. Those things are really cool, man. Thanks. All right. Now, my um, my name is Christian Millet, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I have to express a little concern. You know, the thing is, that's always kind of upset me is that when everybody says biofuels, they're always thinking um, alcohol. And there's, there's a lot of different biofuels. And, you know, I mean, I hear you speak and you keep on talking about this alcohol like it's, um, there's problems to be overcome and it's a, futurist, a future technology. And that's a little bit upsetting because biofuels like algae is a proven technology in the past. I mean, if you look at the Department of Energy's aquatic species program, I mean, they were getting probably 16% efficiency in Hawaii, I mean, sustainably, you know, and alcohol really doesn't work. I mean, all of the sources of energy or biomass that you listed would result in catastrophic environmental damage. I mean, we have to have this carbon going back into the soil. I mean, but algae is an efficient one. I mean, algae, we can run out of water, we can run out of salt water, we can do it this is the simplest organism. So I just kind of wanted to throw some attention to that because, I mean, if you look at algae, they were getting oil for $1.50 to $4 a gallon. Now, that was too expensive in 1980. That's competitive nowadays. Um, I mean, whenever we talk about this, people ask me, it's just, it's just so stupid that we didn't do it, you know. And, and this, this myth that biofuels is alcohol is a little upsetting because that keeps on making people think that there's all kinds of technological hurdles that have to be overcome when the fact is, we could have done this right now. Well, Is Jim, you mentioned al uh, algae as a potential. So algae, algae are a very compelling uh, potential fuel source. What's compelling about it is they're like little plants. They take carbon dioxide and water out of the atmosphere with using, uh, using solar energy. They turn that into sugars. And they, unlike many other organisms, uh, they actually produce an excess of energy during the day and store it as, as hydrocarbons, as lipid, uh, so, uh, because it's a, it's a convenient, high-density fuel source for them to use when the sun's not shining. So uh, DOE and many others, uh, more than a decade ago, started the aquatic, the aquatic species program that you, you spoke about to try and survey the algal species that exist to try and find one that might make enough gasoline so that it could be a readily, um, uh, a readily used uh, substrate for, for biofuels. Not surprisingly, the perfect organism wasn't identified. It, it's a little bit like, from my perspective, uh, like expecting to walk into your local, uh, into uh, a forest somewhere and find uh, modern corn. You know, that's not where modern corn came from. We developed modern corn over 10,000 years of selective breeding. So uh, the downside of algae um, are that they're very hard to engineer. And so the amount of, of as I understand it, the amount of, of uh, lipid that uh, algae will produce now uh, makes them not an ideal biofuel source. Uh, although there are lots of companies that are, that are working on technology to make that, uh, to make that not be the case. Uh, they're very compelling on the surface. It's been hard to make it actually happen. But it's the, the largest investor in the algal biofuels industry, again, is the U.S. military, because they see, uh, they see that as a very promising, uh, uh, a very promising area. So there's, that's one area that has gotten a lot of private investment lately, DOE is of a mixed mind about algae. They're sort of taking a wait-and-see attitude. Our interest is in providing that infrastructure. The JGI is the world's largest producer of algal genomes. We are producing those genomes so that the parts lists are there, so that as the, the scientists learn how to engineer those organisms, uh, we'll be able to take advantage of that. So. Thank you. Interest, the, the same technologies that we talked about, about engineering yeast to produce uh, hydrocarbons could be ported to something like an al algal species. Yeah. They're just harder to engineer at, cur at current. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, on this side, though. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, I know. Uh, you have, they're around one billion tons 
uh, relatively underutilized uh, biomass here in the U.S. Uh, and I guess my question is, what, while I recognize that there is certainly biomass that we do truly waste uh, here in the U.S., how do you address the ecological consequences of large-scale or even maximized uh, extraction of biomass from agricultural and forest ecosystems? And as a second part of that question, um, how do you all, as synthetic biologists rather than ecologists, uh, regard our soils, uh, especially in light of viable alternative uses for that biomass, such as community composting programs like the ecology centers here in Berkeley? Right. So uh, I think that uh, it's really important that we study uh, the impacts of removing this amount of biomass from the soils. Uh, in fact, some of these studies have been done. If you remove a lot of uh, corn stover, from the fields, over time, the, the microbial community changes substantially, and you have to, uh, you end up adding more fertilizers to the soil to get the same yields of corn that you would have if you hadn't removed that corn stover. So it's very clear that removing certain kinds of biomass really impacts uh, the the soil and the soil community. Now, as Jim mentioned, there are uh, plants like uh, miscanthus that in the winter send most of the nutrients back into the soil. And this could have evolved because uh, in uh, ancient times, the fields might have burned much more as a way to preserve the nutrients so that when the crops come back up the next spring, uh, they have all the nutrients there in the soil. So, and, and studies have been done actually at the University of Illinois, one of our partners in the Energy Biosciences Institute, on uh, the effects on the soil when you remove this biomass from these tall grasses like miscanthus. So uh, I agree with you that it's really important that we study how this is going to impact the soils, and, and these studies are being done. So two thirds, there's another two, question up here in the balcony area. Two thirds of the biomass that DOE intends to uh, to put into use as, it, as part of the billion tons that will replace 20% of transportation fuels by 2020, I think is the target. Two-thirds of that will come from waste streams and one-third from, uh, from new agricultural. Uh, so it, a significant fraction of the biomass is coming from uh, biomass that we're dumping into landfills currently. I, I'd like to pick this gentleman here, please. Uh, you've been waiting. Okay. Um, as a chemical engineer, it's always struck me as a, a terrible waste of a fantastic chemical to burn oil for, in, in cars. And similarly, with uh, plant matter, shouldn't we be looking at the reverse situation? Rather than trying to degrade plants to make fuels, shouldn't we be looking to see how plants fixate CO2 to make the fantastic chemicals that they do? Because fuel is only one thing we get from oil and uh, there are a lot of things we're going to miss when the oil runs out. So I'd like to ask the panel what their views are on that. That's a, a great question and, and comment. Um, in fact, uh, the same technologies that can be used to produce artemisinin <coughs> and, and biofuels can be used to produce commodity chemicals, and there are some examples out there. So DuPont has engineered E. coli to produce a precursor that normally to carpet fiber that normally would have been gotten from uh, fossil fuels now is derived from sugar um, and you can actually buy this carpet I think Mohawk offers it it's uh, the Serona carpet fiber um, and it's biologically produced precursors to those carpet fibers and and there are numerous examples uh, out there in fact um, many many examples that have been around for many years citric acid for instance has been produced microbially and many other uh, products so I agree with you that we are going to have to have, if petroleum resources dwindle, we're going to have to have other sources for those products that we would normally have gotten from petroleum. And biology offers those routes. We're also sequencing uh, eucalyptus now. Uh, and anybody who's walked by a eucalyptus uh, tree can tell you they're, they're making some things that you don't find anywhere else, uh, <laughs> including a large number of, of uh, aromatic hydrocarbons that are not found anywhere else, but then involve uh, chemical transitions that, that are enzymatically driven and then may be quite useful for the, uh, for the chemical industry. So harvesting, uh, harvesting not just the natural products from, from trees like, uh, like eucalyptus, but actually harvesting the molecular machinery that produces uh, some of these unusual chemistries, uh, un unusual compounds, may be um, 
a real growth industry going forward as we begin to understand the metabolism in these, uh, in these various organisms. So, and, and that will be a critical part to making the biofuels industry cost competitive. It's the side streams that often make the difference between a, uh, between a cost competitive uh, uh, process and, and an industrial process that fails. And you could turn that genetics just as easily to mm -hmm. the eucalyptus tree, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same, fun, same DNA sequencing will tell you about how eucalyptus trees make those enzymes that create those natural products, those microorganisms and all. Hmm. Um, yes, sir. Oops, yeah. one up here. Um, Sorry, beg your pardon. You're spending billions of dollars, or would it be a trillion dollars on this type of research? I'm concerned because with the technology we already have, there's been the problems that are polluting the whole ocean. And the ocean itself could take a huge amount of carbon dioxide out of the air, but it's, it's getting very sick and it's not working. And so if you turned your effort and the money into cleaning up the problems created by all the technology you've been making before you start something new, have you ever considered that? So uh, <laughs> carbon sequestration is another. We have three primary missions, the first being alternative really? fuels. Uh, second being uh, uh, understanding global carbon cycling and how organisms in the ocean... Are you answering my question? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking getting there. about cleaning up all the toxics. The lab the, itself is sitting on and the third, toxic sol solvents in the, in the land, and he's not answering it. He's talking yeah. about... Let, let's, let's let him answer in his way, if we could. Thank you. And the third part of our mission is, is understanding how toxins move through the environment and how to remove them. So uh, depending on the toxin you're talking about, if you're talking about CO2, uh, the oceans will play a major role in scrubbing CO2 from the environment. Uh, if you're talking about, if you're talking about uh, environmental toxins, microorganisms that Susanna's been talking about, uh, as well as uh, plants, are uh, major sources of removal for those toxins, and that's a major part of our mission. Perhaps another panel will be able to answer that. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Oh, thank you, John. Um, so you kicked off this conversation by saying that we are running out of immediate um, fuel. I just want to add a little asterisk to that. I think we're, the consensus here in Berkeley is that we're running out of the atmosphere to put the carbon dioxide. And the panel talked about the fuel being carbon neutral, but we are kind of on this path of exponentially heating up the earth. So this uh, going into the biofuels, um, is that really the best approach to the reason why we're all here facing this climate crisis? Or is this perhaps another sort of scheme by BP? I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying it is, but I'm just, I just want to ask a scientist without any sort of other judgments aside, is this the best solution that we have? Or is this kind of continuing on with the same infrastructure because there's existing resistance to change? So, so I, I think, you know, for the last hundred years or so, we've depended only on petroleum or fossil fuels for our energy. And, and if we intend to replace that, uh, we can't look at just one solution. So this is just one part to play in that. And in fact, biofuels may supply a small fraction of the energy. We're going to have to have better batteries so that we can collect and, soar, and store solar energy, and there's research going on in that. Uh, in the immediate future, we need to uh, approach efficiency so that we have the most efficient automobiles, the most efficient houses, the most efficient buildings so that we use as little energy as possible. And coal is not going away in the near future, so we have to have ways to try to scrub the flue gas of carbon dioxide. And we have programs that we're starting up now at Berkeley Lab to learn how to capture that carbon and turn it into useful materials or to even store it underground. But we'd like to, to turn it into useful materials if we can. So I, I think it's not going to be just one solution. It's going to be many solutions. And biofuels are one aspect of this. But the important thing is that we do research in all of these areas now um, so that 
we can get to these solutions as soon as possible. Would it be fair to say that even when this becomes a mature technology, it is still just a bridge to a carbon-less technology? It's going to be a long bridge, right. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it could be a bridge. It also um, depends uh, on, on how effectively we can do this. Uh, if you can capture all of the CO2 that you're generating from a coal-fired power plant, and you know, algae will grow in 95% CO2, a very convenient carbon scrubbing mm -hmm. source. Take that, take that biomass, they generate a little bit of fuel, use that fuel to turn the algae into biochar, like basically charcoal briquettes, bury that again, or burn it again. Uh, if, you can, if you could make a cycle like that work, uh, then maybe you can continue to use coal. And I think all of these sorts of things, various people are thinking about, we need to, we need to approach them all. Coal's not going away. But what we're talking about today is primarily transportation fuels, because Americans are going to drive. Hopefully everybody in Berkeley is going to take BART. Yeah. <laughs> but if you live in East Texas, you don't have BART. And we're going to need to provide a transportation fuel that is carbon neutral. So someone in... Hi, I, um, I'm constantly amazed how various government agencies like CARB and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District are making um, your work uh, very hard to sort of uh, use, where you can't buy a diesel car in California, they uh, get upset about the nitrous oxide and biodiesel, and um, don't, give any, uh, don't seem to make any distinction between um, carbon coming from fossil fuels or you know, carbon neutral things like you're describing. Do you have any suggestions of what anybody May we, uh, anybody could do to sort of get them to sort of bite off on this a little better? We have a lot of competing elements in our society, correct? I mean, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, there was a good reason that uh, we didn't have diesel cars uh, in California, right? Because they were polluting the atmosphere and we were getting acid rain uh, from the diesel. Now we've got uh, much more efficient diesel cars that are coming out, and so. That's certainly a possibility, but of course you can't put biodiesel in those cars because you void your warranty if you do. Uh, but what's coming, what's on the horizon, are uh, biodiesels that are better than petroleum-based diesels. These are diesels that uh, will uh, get uh, as good a gas mileage but have significantly less pollution coming out of the tailpipe. Um, and, and those are coming in the next few years. So. Um, Stay tuned. I think, I think we'll see those coming online. And in terms of, of what you can do about uh, these government agencies, I mean, you're a citizen. Um, go to them. We, we all try to go to them and argue our case. Um, and it's important, but there are competing interests. Mm -hmm. Were you saying fuel? Sir? Or yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you guys, obviously. As employees of uh, Berkeley, do you think it is still reasonable to consider UC Berkeley a truly public institution when it receives so much funding for, for propri proprietary industrial research? So, uh, uh, UC Berkeley's uh, budget, research budget is um, 800 million, something like that. Uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory has uh, a research budget that's about the same order of magnitude. So we're talking about uh, one and a half to two billion dollars a year in research budget. Uh, the BP effort um, is 50 million dollars a year, so a small fraction of that, and a small fraction of that. 500 million. On 500 million, but but that's uh, 500 million over 10 years, so that's 50 million a year in what's uh, a 1.5 to 2 billion dollar research budget with the two institutions combined and. Not all of that's going to Berkeley. Some of that's also going to Illinois. So it, it's actually a very small perturbation of the total research budgets of those institutions. And, and on top of that, uh, BP didn't get anything else that any other company couldn't get by coming to our institutions. So Berkeley is still a public institution. Berkeley is still a public <laughs> institution. And we've got the budget cuts to show it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a question up there? Yes, my name is Andrew Knoll, and I'm a local entrepreneur that's worked with second-generation biofuels like Jatropha um, in West Africa. 
And my question is, is working in the international realm, I dealt firsthand with the Kyoto Protocol and clean development mechanisms in which sustainability throughout the process of growing the crop to the pipe, you had standards all the way through. We don't have that here in the United States. Do you see that cap and trade being passed could benefit us or hurt us in developing the next generation fuels? Well, uh, anything that equalizes the playing field, uh, I think, is important. You know, we don't incorporate um, the cost to the environment in many cases of using petroleum-based fuels. We don't incorporate the costs of of protecting uh, uh, the waters where the ships are coming through to deliver those petroleum-based fuels. Um, we don't incorporate the cost of the war in Iraq, for instance, in the cost of our, our fuels, petroleum-based fuels. So anything that will equalize that and put uh, renewable fuels on the same ground as petroleum-based fuels, I think, is really important. Yeah, and I think without, without sustained investment and without a sustained uh, message from, from the government, from, uh, from the federal government, that biofuels are important, uh, the industry won't flourish the way that it might. But if once the investors realize that there is an opportunity here and that the playing field is going to be leveled, then I think uh, American innovation will, uh, will show us how quickly we can do this. I guess about 20 percent of the sunlight energy and uh, a biofuel or any kind of vegetation gets a few tenths of 1 percent. And that's, almost, that's a factor of 30 or um, different, uh, difference. And uh, so wouldn't it make sense to, to cover 100 miles by 100 miles with photovoltaic cells? You can do that in New Mexico and produce all the electricity for the country, as an example here, if you use biofuels to produce that much energy, you're going to have to cover the whole country. And uh, so uh, if one used photovoltaic cells and then you have all this electricity, then you can produce whatever you want, hydrogen or carbon, anything else. Uh, and uh, wouldn't that be a much better way of going than going through all this sort of rigmarole of, uh, of genetic engineering and covering the Amazon forest and everything is, else? Is, 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 are, is an electric in infrastructure better than a biological infrastructure for creating fuels and creating energy for us to use? I think in the long run it could be. Yeah. It's, it's a potential, and I agree with you that they're, they're very efficient. Our problem is storing electricity, one. Um, so if we had better batteries, which we're, there's a lot of research now going on to try to find better batteries, but it's been going on for quite a while. Um, but we do need better batteries, and I think uh, in you know, the intermediate term we're going to see a lot of uh, passenger automobiles replaced with electric vehicles, but that's not, we're not going to have battery airplanes anytime soon, um, or large trucks. So we do need transportation fuels because that's the energy, there's a huge amount of energy stored uh, in that. But the question was, uh, with electricity, you can make hydrogen, you can make oil, I mean, you can make anything. And as energy goes into energy, it's, it's all uh, equal. And, uh, so um, why not get the sunlight energy and photovoltaic cells, then you can make all the chemicals that you like. And it, in fact, research is going on to try to, be, to do this in the future. So we call it, this is our solar uh, fuels program. It's called the Solar Energy Research Center, or CERC, at Berkeley Lab. And we're actually working on that. But there's a lot of research that needs to be done in order to make fuels from sunlight without a biological system involved, but we're researching that as well. Sir. Uh, yeah, I also had a question about the, the connection to the military. Um, just considering all of the resources and uh, uh, various resources, human and, and chemical, that go into securing a lot of the, the world's energy in the Middle East, uh, 
Um, does the panel think that the stores of cellulose would also in the future be sites of, you know, future conflict and, and militaries? <laughs> and then beyond that, um, just considering how strategically important that Middle Eastern oil is, do you believe that your technology would not be at some point controlled or that it would be equally distributed or, uh, to all countries in the world? Fortunately, plants grow everywhere. So I don't think there are going to be um, cellulose wars. Um, uh, I, I think the issue of the technology involved um, I think is, is important and how that will be distributed, who's going to own it, uh, will be important because if, if one, let's just uh, put on our dreamers hat and say that we could make a cellulosic biofuel for half the cost of petroleum uh, and that technology was, uh, was owned uniquely within the United States, yet we have the opportunity to, um, to distribute that technology and dramatically reduce the amount of carbon we're putting in the atmosphere. I think we have some obligation to do that for the world. So uh, what that looks like, I'm not, I'm not sure I know, but I think, uh, I think it's something that will need to get discussed. A switchgrass cartel? <laughs> <laughs> the plants won't be the problem. Sir. Yes, hi there. Um, first off, thank you all very much for coming. I think this has been fascinating for everybody. Um, and uh, hoping this isn't too inflammatory of a question uh, for certain members of the audience. But uh, in the exact same vein as what he was asking, we've got all this biomass out there. It's got this energy stored in carbon. We've been combusting things since... Um, Caveman, I presume, is a good one for him. Um, and that releases energy. It, it, in what proportion to the energy released during combustion um, is the energy being harnessed in biofuels? And if that proportion is further in favor of combustion, how come we're not simply taking the waste, burning it, turning it into electricity, and foregoing a lot of research? So, I, sorry, I, I, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's phenomenal. Don't no, take that away for a it second. Is, but it's, just it's, a perfectly, um, it's a perfectly sane question. It is absolutely carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. right? If you burn, we know, how to make, uh, we know how to make a fire. We know how to make steam. Mm -hmm. We know how to turn a turbine to make energy with that. And in fact, the, the calculations for cellulosic biofuels uh, uh, carbon neutrality critically depend on taking the non-cellulose part of the tree and actually burning it uh, the way the paper industry does now uh, so that they don't have an electricity bill at the end of the month. So it's absolutely part of the equation. We can't, um, so why aren't we just burning biomass to make electricity? Um, uh, we, we then get back to the same question of can, how well will electric cars work? How do we carry that energy around? Are we going to have good enough batteries to be able to do that? Um, uh, and that's an open question. That, that is um, certainly an open question, but do you know we energy, also energy for energy, kind of pound for pound, how it stacks up against one another after going through all the degradation? Right. Of what they so it's actually in one of my slides where you saw the bar if you just burned the biomass and how much energy you get out. And then if you looked at the smaller bar, um, that was how much energy you get out if you convert it into fuel. So we're talking about six percent, half yeah. ish. Okay. Uh, uh, we're, we're out of time, and we're actually over time. Uh, yes, ma'am, you have the last question. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask uh, the panel whether or not the Lawrence Berkeley Lab is doing research in hydrogen fuel, you know, hydrogen cars, and also. I'd like to be able to, to one day see if you can paint your cars, all the outside exterior part of the cars, into solar cells so that we can, hmm. you know, we can drive and produce our electricity while we are driving, hopefully not get cooked in the process while we are inside. <laughs> I wish you were here uh, last month. We talked just about that. We had a, uh, we had a panel talking about uh, solar cells and new batteries. Uh, and we talked specifically about that. You have a great idea. And uh, uh, Jay, I want to give you the last word. What, what happens? What do you know about hydrogen? What do you know about hydrogen? <laughs> <laughs> it's the fuel of the future and always will be. <laughs> <laughs>
I want to. 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 Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I, I'm so heartened that I saw so many first first time hands. Uh, next month we'll be back, and uh, we'll have yet another fascinating topic to discuss. Uh, but for now, thank you very kindly. I really appreciate your time. Please for the panel.